Congress. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome back to the Foreign Press Centers. We're very pleased to have with us another briefing on foreign policy for the Hillary campaign. Uh, before we begin, a kind reminder to silence your cell phones. And uh, I'm very pleased to welcome today uh, Daniel Feldman, an advisor to Hillary for America. He's a non-resident senior fellow with the National Security and International Policy Team at American Progress. Additionally, Mr. Feldman serves as senior advisor at the Albright Stonebridge Group, where he works with the Middle East and Europe practices and other global projects. He brings more than 20 years of experience in international trade policy and corporate social responsibility, an area of law that he helped establish. Mr. Feldman served as special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan at the U.S. Department of State, during which time he was given the rank of ambassador. While at the State Department, he was a principal advisor to Secretaries of State John Kerry and Hillary Clinton on issues related to South Asia, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Uh, a reminder that, of course, with all briefings at the convention, uh, the views are those of Mr. Feldman and do not represent those of the State Department or U.S. government at this time. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. And um, it's good to be back briefing the State Department press corps. Um, I left the State Department last September after serving over six years uh, in the office of Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, first as uh, deputy to Ambassador Holbrook and his successors, uh, Mark Grossman and Jim Dobbins, and then um, as Special Representative myself from 2014 to 2015. Uh, in that capacity, as you heard, I, I worked very, very closely with um, Secretary Clinton and her team. Uh, but I actually first met her uh, when I was on the National Security Council staff in the Clinton administration, um, and then later when I was working uh, in the Senate at the same time, uh, just after she was elected uh, senator from New York. So um, I've worked with her and, um, and her team for quite a while, and I'm here purely out of my own uh, personal passion and conviction uh, that I have never seen, as President Obama himself has said, someone uh, who is more qualified than she is uh, to be president. And certainly, given the alternative that we have um, with the Trump campaign, the only person that has the experience and the judgment uh, to keep us safe and to advance our national security uh, interests as president and commander-in-chief from uh, the very first day. So uh, given all the time that I spent with her, and particularly what I saw her bring um, to uh, her role uh, as secretary uh, in the pursuit of finding a more sustainable and stable uh, future for Afghanistan, uh, where she helped to reintroduce America to the rest of um, to the rest of the world after eight disastrous years of George Bush's foreign policy, where we built together a contact group of over 50 nations, uh, which is still existing today, uh, who were engaged in Afghanistan and are were committed to its future. Uh, where she elevated the role of women and children in the future of Afghanistan, where she was extremely engaged uh, in the region uh, and was tough on counterterrorism um, uh, measures and, um, uh, and her narrative about the importance, obviously, of safeguarding uh, American citizens, but also in terms of finding a more sustainable future for Afghanistan. And, her judgment, uh, her analysis, um, and her conviction and passions were what I was continuously impressed by and where I vowed after I left government to come back and do uh, whatever I could to help ensure uh, that she was elected president. So let me just leave it at that and, and, and welcome any questions. Thank you. Dimitri Kirsanov of TAS, thanks for doing this, Ambassador, and thanks to the people at the FTC for arranging the briefing. Uh, what's in the cards for U.S.-Russian relationship if Secretary Clinton is elected president? Well, first of all, I just want to make sure I'm not advising her on, on these issues, and I think that um, no foreign policy advisor would want to entertain kind of hypothetical issues at this point. The most important thing, obviously, would be to assess the circumstances um, once, uh, once she became president, to hear our 
the intelligence briefing, to hear the military briefings, to determine what the diplomatic um, challenges were, uh, and then to assess that. And that's the type of process that I saw her execute on a on a daily basis, where she gathered all the, um, the, the inputs in a very analytic way and listened and then uh, took action. But what I do think it points out is the just remarkably stark distinction that we have between her approach, particularly on a country like Russia and Donald Trump's, where I believe, I firmly believe that if he is elected, they will be celebrating in Moscow. Uh, his um, support for strongmen across the board, but particularly for Putin, is dangerous and so out of step with decades of a bipartisan approach to key foreign policy challenges, including in Russia. And I am confident that she will continue to uh, assemble and engage the broader international community, particularly uh, NATO, which, again, uh, Donald Trump has already distanced himself from, to determine the best way forward and the most effective way forward. I can't, I can't hear you. Based on what, on what you just said, I'm guessing we can expect further worsening of the bilateral relationship. I, I think what will be done is a careful analysis of what can be done uh, with the effort of ensuring and safeguarding American interests and values, but doing it in the most effective way possible. And we'll have to see what the instruments are uh, to best deliver that, whether those are economic or with sanctions, diplomatic, military, and how best to engage uh, the rest of the international community, including NATO, on, on, on addressing that. What I saw continuously in working for Secretary Clinton was not only that passion and compassion, but the real focus on achieving results. I mean, that was ultimately where her policy interests were. How do we translate this and ensure that we are furthering U.S. policy interests and we are actually having impact? And that is, I'm sure, the prism that she would view this through as well. Thank you very much. Um, Vincent Yi from BBC World Service. Um, we have heard a lot of uh, pressure from both uh, Republican Party and Bernie Sanders on the issue of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. Um, is Secretary Clinton going to say anything about TPP? Where does she stand on this? If she gets elected, how is she going to put forward this uh, uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership? Thank you. I, 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 have no, I have no idea what further she would say on TPP beyond what she's already said. I wouldn't want to um, add anything uh, to her statements already on that. I certainly know that there's a uh, – and uh, can – Given you heard in part my, my background, which when I've been in the private sector has been focused on corporate social responsibility issues. Those include labor and environmental issues. These are issues that um, are at the core of my concerns. So I think this balancing act in terms of how we continue uh, to uh, look at trade policies uh, and expand opportunities for U.S. products and U.S. consumers uh, working collectively with partners, but also making sure that these key concerns are addressed is something that has continued to, to bubble up in all these campaigns, including on the Republican side as well as on the Democratic side. So it's one that we will have to all grapple with together uh, once we have a clear direction with the new president. Thank you. My name is Morten Bertelsen from uh, Norway and uh, Dagens Næringsliv, a business newspaper. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on Hillary's plan to defeat ISIS and why the part, uh, party isn't talking more about, defeat, uh, about terrorism as such at this uh, convention. Thanks. Uh, first of all, we've only had one night of the convention thus far, so we've got three more days. I would urge everyone to assess that based on the totality of what you hear. Uh, and I think that you'll undoubtedly hear um, far more on national security and foreign policy issues over, over the coming days. I think last night was incredibly important and a remarkable success in um, dispensing with this sense of a, of a lack of unity. At the end of the day, this will be a very, very unified party, not only in their support for Hillary, but absolutely in what uh, – in the dangerous alternative that Trump presents. Um, I think, as with everything else, she would have to uh, continue to assess the facts when she became president. Um, look at that intelligence, convene the right uh, nations, continue to engage multilaterally. 
Um, I don't advise specifically on counterterrorism. There are there are key experts, and so again, I would defer to those. But again, the process of coming up with that, I think, is uh, is one that's very important, and one I saw replicated in terms of that uh, that analysis. And I think that you'll find. Um, again, many, many key supporters, uh, including uh, across the political spectrum, and including many traditional Republicans, um, and on uh, and on ISIL in particular. I know uh, General Allen, who's been recently heading that up, will be uh, speaking at the convention later after announcing his support uh, over the last few days. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Nazal Kapitina. I'm a reporter for Ukrainian TV station studio One Plus One. And uh, actually, the question is about what should Ukraine expect from the office of Hillary Clinton uh, regarding uh, increasing sanctions towards Russia and either any chance for Ukraine to receive uh, military assistance, lethal and non-lethal. What could be a position? Yeah. I mean, again, I. I'm not engaging in any policy prescriptions, especially for areas of the world where I've not had responsibility. Um, but I think that she has already laid out um, some significant pillars and tenets of her approach on many of these key issues, in, including in her approach to Russia, um, and the way in which she has brought together the international community in the past, certainly on economic sanctions, uh, uh, which ultimately helped lead to the JCPOA in Iran, um, but utilizing all the instruments uh, at, uh, at, at, the, at, at the Secretary of State's disposal um, and, and which can bring to bear U.S. Uh, foreign policy goals, whether that's um, economic through continued sanctions, whether that's diplomatic, military, intelligence, and then working collectively uh, with our key partners to ensure that we have a sense of um, what the most effective mechanisms are and then really how to implement and operationalize those uh, to ensure that they have real impact. And so um, minus the specifics of the Ukraine example, I've seen that repeated many times ineffectively. Uh, Jose Carreño with Excelsior newspaper of Mexico City. Uh, uh, the, Mexico appears to be for good or for ill in the center of the arguments in this, uh, in this election as a whole. So I would like to ask you uh, how, uh, to what degree Mexico is, uh, or where does Mrs. Clinton would like to take the relationship with Mexico, and how does she feel about uh, the so-called North American community? Um, well, I, I, I think, again, that she has um, continued to note, and others on her, on, on her, on her team have noted, uh, how lucky we are to have the neighbors that we have and what opportunities uh, there are for um, continued trade and growth in the relationship. Um, so again, without getting into the specifics of regional areas that I, I don't have the background in, um, I know that um, the continued engagement um, with our with our with our neighbors, Mexico and Canada, was a hallmark of uh, of her time as secretary, um, and I think that uh, it certainly demonstrates, um, I believe, the Republicans' uh, bad faith in uh, in the way that they kept our uh, ambassador designate from being confirmed to Mexico for. Uh, for an unconscionable amount of time, uh, and that continuing to ensure that we have uh, a strong relationships with key partners um, is, is will, will, will certainly uh, be a continued commitment of, uh, of hers and, and her administrations. Uh, Ambassador, welcome to FPC Foreign Press Center again. Uh, as an expert on South Asia yourself, you can't duck this one. You, you, for the campaign, Hillary Clinton campaign, you probably are the representative of all the wisdom there is on South Asia. Uh, we haven't heard very much on South Asia from the Clinton campaign. Uh, from the Republicans we heard last week in their platform, there was a couple of uh, paras on India and Pakistan and Afghanistan. So I'm not uh, asking you to, I don't expect you to go into the specifics, but broadly, where do you uh, what could South Asia, specifically India, expect from a Clinton administration? Thank you. Well, I think again, look to look to her um, 
commitments to South Asia when she was secretary. Her frequent travel there, and I accompanied her uh, to India, to Pakistan, to Afghanistan, all numerous times. Um, her commitment to um, continue to try to knit together this, you know, one of the, the, the least connected uh, regions of the world between South and Central Asia. Um, her commitment to uh, economic uh, and commercial dialogues, including elevating strategic dialogues with several countries of the region. Uh, her commitment to uh, multilateral approaches um, to, to these regional uh, uh, issues, whether from um, the, broader, uh, the broader international community, as we saw in Afghanistan, uh, to continuing to try to strengthen and empower uh, key regional uh, initiatives like she did with, uh, with the Heart of Asia process uh, and, and, and others. And so uh, I expect that, um, that there, there is already a real growth in our relationships with key South Asian countries uh, over the course of the last seven years. Uh, there's enormous uh, continued opportunity to expand and strengthen those relationships, uh, and I'm sure that she will continue uh, to take advantage of that. David Lawler with the Daily Telegraph newspaper. Um, the UK now has a female prime minister, uh, so obviously it would be historic for the US-UK relationship for it to be steered by two women. And I was wondering if you could uh, speak to that, whether you know of any communication between them and also just, um, you know, in a difficult period for the relationship post-Brexit, uh, what might be in store uh, if she's elected president. Yeah. I don't know and wouldn't know of any particular communications. That doesn't mean that they haven't occurred. Um, what I have seen over 20 years of working with her is this continued commitment to issues of, uh, of women and children. And, but women uh, in a place like Afghanistan in particular, which was really elevated by her focus on this, uh, in conjunction with, with key partners, including uh, at a London conference that, uh, that was held in early 2010, where we uh, rolled out a, a, a policy on, on women's rights issues, and uh, in her continued effort uh, to support a reconciliation process, which has always had three tenets since she first announced it, this is in Afghanistan, uh, since she first announced it in, um, in 2009 or 2010, and those remain the same. Uh, which has always been that the Taliban split from al-Qaeda, that they lay down arms, and that they embrace the Afghan constitution, including the rights of women. And the fact that she was out there vocally uh, discussing this, that she sent her special ambassador uh, for women and creating this position, for, first from Milan Rivera and now being held by Kathy Russell, and that it helped to highlight and spotlight the role of women and the role of development issues in, uh, entwined with, with diplomatic and strategic interests is something that she uniquely brought there. And I'm sure that she would love to take advantage of the opportunity of working with other uh, key women leaders um, ar around the world. On, on, on Brexit, obviously, everyone has committed to trying to ensure that this special relationship remains uh, as unique and special as it's been. But we're, we're all in uncharted territory right now, and we'll have to see uh, where this continues to go. Thank you, uh, Elliot Waldman with Tokyo Broadcasting System. Thanks for doing this. Um, Hillary Clinton's uh, disavowal of the, the TPP sent some mixed messages to uh, the East Asia Pacific region, given that it was such an important part of the rebalance to Asia, which was a policy initiative that she um, was in charge of implementing as Secretary of State. Will she continue to um, focus on East Asia and the Pacific as president, or will would there be kind of a re-rebalancing mm -hmm. under a Clinton administration? Well, again, I'm, I I'm not the one that can lay out her uh, her first hundred days, but certainly it was very very important being at the State Department from its very from the very outset of her tenure as secretary, what that rebalance to Asia uh, actually meant that it was um, serious and and uh, and rigorous, um, whether it was from the symbolism of the of the first trips to uh, the continued engagement uh, across the region in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, uh, including in places like uh, like Burma, um, in South Asia, where I was more familiar with it. Um, and we'll have to, again, as I said to the previous question on TPP, um, there are legitimate concerns with, um, with big international trade deals like these, uh, and we will have to continue uh, to assess how we can advance both economic and security interests, uh, continue to ensure um, that we are growing and strengthening our key uh, uh, bilateral and multilateral relationships, but also ensuring that these 
uh, agreements have legitimate safeguards for these concerns on on labor and environmental and a, and a range of other issues. What I think is what I think is clear again, though, is the stark contrast that you have between someone like Hillary Clinton and someone like Donald Trump, where it is truly dangerous and truly unprecedented the positions that he has taken on a whole range of agreements, whether that's trade agreements uh, to others like uh, JCPOA, and without any sense of what the alternatives may actually be, suggesting that he and he alone can uh, can fix these, can renegotiate these, or anything else. It just shows uh, such a lack of understanding of what actually goes into these key agreements. And uh, and again, it brings us back to the fact that uh, that Hillary Clinton is truly the only candidate at this point who has the experience and ability to lead this country from day one. Hi. Gretel Johnson with the German Press Agency. I'm going to take you back to the question on uh, security and terrorism. Uh, we've seen the headlines coming out of Europe. Uh, it's, it seems to, uh, I think you would probably agree that the campaign, the Trump campaign will be trying to show that the Clinton campaign is not as strong on foreign policy as, as it is. Um, I think you've used the words a couple of times um, saying that there'll be a careful analysis of the situation, saying that the Clintons would be more likely to engage with multinationally with other partners. The question is, do you think that's what the voters actually want to hear from their, from, from the candidate, given everything that's happened in Europe recently and the, the terrorism that we've seen gone very much off the scale right now? I think voters, and I have confidence that voters at the end of the day, um, will want pragmatic, realistic, effective policy solutions. And that is what Hillary Clinton offers, and most importantly, what Donald Trump does not offer. He may fearmonger, he may uh, be divisive, uh, he may try to scare everyone, and it doesn't mean there, that there aren't some legitimate reasons for concern. We all recognize that. We all want to address those as effectively as possible. But as I said at the, at the outset, she was always focused on what gets results. How do we actually ensure that this is addressed effectively? And that is, I'm sure, uh, given that the, 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 the fundamental precept of being pres president is to ensure the security and vitality of the American people, she will take as her chief priority. Um, and so I think she will bring great energy and great rigor to this process, uh, into her engagements, uh, and undoubtedly it will be, it will be more effective. Um, and I think that uh, what, what Donald Trump has sketched out is not only so discordant from what we've seen, you've already seen it uh, in the difference between the convention last week in Cleveland and what you heard last night, the fact that we are all unified in this party in coming together, in presenting a more optimistic sense of our inclusiveness and diversity uh, and strengths, and I think you will hear much more on the national security and foreign policy front in the days ahead, um, but that ultimately the alternative not only is dark and somber, um, but it is dangerous. And it is dangerous in terms of the strongmen that, uh, that, that Trump is touting. It's dangerous in terms of walking away from our alliances. It's dangerous in terms of ripping up decades worth of, of, of international agreements. Um, and so we have a remarkably stark choice here. And I think that uh, reasonable voters that look at the, at the data, and I urge um, all the American citizens living abroad and all of your readerships and constituencies um, to register to vote, <laughs> to get online and ensure when they still have time right now to get out and make sure that they cast their vote because as an alum of the 2000 Gore campaign and having spent 35 days in Tallahassee, Florida, I know that every single vote really matters, especially in an election that will be as closely fought as this, but that at the end of the day there is a very, very stark difference in terms of the vision of America what we do and how effective we'll be, particularly on the issue of counterterrorism. Thank you very much.